Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Lori Shaw and I am the charge nurse on orthopedics. I am here to teach the pre-op teaching class for Doctors Hospital. Um, I am going to take off my mask so that you can better understand me since I'm far enough away from everybody. Um, I'd like everybody to kind of hold your questions till the end. It, the class just goes much smoother that way. We understand that you have questions um, about some, a topic I might talk about, but we will go ahead and get started. This is Doctors Hospital. The orthopedic floor is called the Orthopedic and Spine Institute. Um, we treat acute and degenerative conditions of the, your knees, your hips, your spine, and we offer the most advanced techniques and treatments to treat orthopedic injuries. So over the years, Doctors Hospital's been awarded many different awards. Um, one of the awards that we're very happy about is our LeapFrog Hospital Safety Aid Grading. Um, we are also a Guardian of Excellence Award. We've received that, American College of Radiology, um, and all of those are awards and recognition that Doctors Hospital has gotten. At Doctors Hospital, we use a team approach. Think of it as a wheel with the patient at the center of the wheel and all of these people that are going to be here to help you on your journey after your surgery. So you're the patient, you're in the middle. Obviously, you're going to have a surgeon that operates on you. The anesthesiologist is the guy who's going to put you to sleep, make sure that you don't feel much when you're anything, when you're having surgery. He'll also be the person that will discuss any issues that you might have. We use a lot of blocks here, spinal blocks, to help with pain control after surgery, but certainly that's not perfect for everybody, especially if you've had back surgery before. But the anesthesiologist will meet with you and discuss what type of anesthesia he'll be using. There may be a medical doctor assigned to you after your surgery. Most of the orthopedic surgeons like to handle just the orthopedic injury, but as people age, we have problems with diabetes, breathing problems, medical problems, heart problems. So there may be a hospitalist that would be assigned to you. We have two physician's assistants that are up on the orthopedic floor. One is named Jen, the other is Chase. They work opposite days. They round on about 98% of all of the post-op orthopedic patients that are on the floor. They communicate with your physician, they may do your dressing change, they're gonna watch you daily and help move you toward the dis through the discharge process. Office staff, make sure you know who you're talking to in the physician office, that the orthopedic office, who does the scheduling, who is the nurse, so that you know if you have a problem post-op who you're gonna call. Yeah, that's the There's going to be nurses that you're going to meet in the hospital. You'll meet them as early as pre-testing. You'll have nurses in the outpatient department, which is where you go prior to your surgery. There's going to be nurses in the operating room. You usually don't remember them, but they yes. are there to they help you. PACU stands for Post Anesthesia Care Unit. And those are, it used to be called the recovery room. It's the area that you will go to after your surgery. You will spend anywhere from one to two hours there to totally wake up after your surgery. And then there's gonna be the nurses on the floor that are gonna take care of you. You'll have physical therapists and occupational therapists come to see you every day. There's no set time. They will be there. They usually like our patients to go ahead and have breakfast and then they will be up after breakfast, anywhere from nine to 11 in the morning, and then if they have to, they'll come back in the afternoon as well. The physical therapist actually gets you up and assess the ability of you to move with that new joint. Um, the occupational therapists, they work on your activities of daily living, so they actually help you decide what you're doing as far as your activities of daily living, how soon you are gonna be able to brush your hair, um, get up, um, how soon you're gonna be able to move around, are you able to, if you had a right shoulder done, are you able to feed yourself? All of those things are gonna be things that the um, 
occupational therapists will gear toward. They also will let you, the best way for them to assess that is to help get you washed up in the morning. And so that's how they actually secretly are doing their assessment, is they're actually helping you do your, your morning activities. Um, the nurse's aides on the floor, they have lots of different responsibilities. They not only will help you get up and go to the bathroom, they take your vital signs, they will check your blood sugar, they will refill your water pitcher, um, help you with just those little things that you may think are just very minor, but that's what they're there for. They, they um, actually have a very important role as assistance to the nursing staff. Um, the pharmacist, there's a pharmacist that will review all of your medications after surgery so that we're not giving you two blood thinners. If the surgeon orders one and you're already on one, their job and their role is to just make sure that we have you back on your medicine as soon as possible, your, your regular routine meds. There is a case manager, they're nurses, and they will start the discharge process as soon as you come up to the floor. So they will come and meet with you, find out what your goal is. Are you gonna go home? Are you gonna um, wanna go to a rehab? Just know that sometimes those plans can change. A lot of people come in with high expectations of going home, but maybe they have some setbacks and because of pain or nausea, they're unable to get up and move the amount that we need them to move to go home. So they may need to go to rehab until they get a little stronger. We also have patients that come in that say, I wanna to go to rehab. Um, and yet on the very first day, they're walking up and down all of the halls and their insurance may not approve for them to go to rehab. So they may, have to change course and have to go home, which you just have to kind of keep an open mind as far as the discharge process. But we like to start it as soon as you come up to the floor so that we can start working on that process. Um, home health, rehab, or an extended care facility. Those are, most of our patients are going to rehab unless they had issues and are going to an extended care facility. The importance of the pre-op class is we believe that more knowledge leads to better outcomes. It'll help reduce your anxiety, increase your motivation, and that learning is gonna be better retained when we do it now than when we're doing it at the bedside when you may have pain. You're gonna have a be called about a pre-testing appointment. It's usually about a week prior to your surgery. They'll have you come in, you check in at registration, you will bring your driver's license, your insurance card, any advanced directives that you have, a copy of any uh, financial obligations, um, a completed list of your home medications. Now, if you are having it, every single person, if you're on a lot of medications, you should always carry an updated list in your purse, in your wallet, with you at all times. I worked in the ER for a long, long time, and it's amazing to me how many people would come in and maybe they were incapacitated and couldn't tell us what meds they were on. And if you think your spouse knows what meds you're on, they don't. They know you take a blood pressure pill and a water pill. And so it's really important. If you don't know how to start to do that, your pharmacist at your local pharmacy can help you. They can actually print your list of medications that you have get on a routine basis filled at that pharmacy. So we are able to sometimes go in and retrieve that off of the, the computer, but that's usually after you've been here for a few days. So we'd like you to make a list. And on that list, we want you to put medications. So we anything that you're buying at the health food store like ginkgo biloba or, you know, this kind of oil or whatever, we understand that maybe those are very important to you, but they're not gonna be given here in the hospital. So those types of things, it is important to tell your doctor that you're taking things like ginkgo and vitamin E because they can cause problems with bleeding, but you don't have to put those on the list. We are looking for prescription um, medication on that list of what you take every day. 
And when you make that list, it's very important to tell us that if you're on a cholesterol-reducing medication like simvastatin, if you take it before you go to bed and that's the way you want to take it, then put next to it, it's a daily medicine, but put that you take it p.m., not a.m. Uh, the reason being, if it's not specified, it may show up on your medication list for us to give it in the morning. Because any, any medicine that's a once a day med will be profiled for us to give it at 10 a.m. So I can't tell you how many times we go into a patient room and they're like, oh no, I take my cholesterol lowering medicine at night. If that's the way you want to take it, then make sure you put that you take it in the evening. At your pre-testing appointment, they're going to go over all of your home medicines, both prescription and over-the-counter meds, including vitamins. Just know that you need to clarify the dose in milligrams or units, not one or two pills. The root, the root is usually PO or by mouth, but some people actually have injectable medications like our diabetics, um, or they get it in a transdermal patch and some people have inhalers. So you just need to be specific on what you're taking. If you take a pill once a day, make sure you say daily in the morning or daily at night, daily AM or PM. The nurse will go over your medical history with you and do a physical assessment. EKG, chest X-ray and blood work that is ordered by your doctor. Not every patient has to have a chest x-ray, but it depends on your age and what your past medical history is. They will also swab your nose for MRSA. MRSA stands for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and it's a bug that just kind of grows on your skin, and they just need to know if you're resistant to the first-line antibiotics. Um, so they will just screen you for that. They'll ask you to sign your consent when you're looking at your consent, make sure it has your correct physician name, make sure it has the correct joint that you're having done, left hip, right hip, um, and you will look over your consent. Once you've read your consent, you will sign it. If you receive a green and yellow armband at your pre-testing appointment, that is your blood bank band. That means that your surgeon may anticipate that in the future while you're here, you may need to have a blood transfusion. So they like to have blood set up and ready for you should that happen. So they will put a green and yellow armband on you and that band number will have your blood bank number on it. Don't remove it because we need to scan that should we have to give you blood. The nurse will go over your list of medications and they are gonna want you to stop all of your blood thinners before your surgery. Aspirin, Coumadin, vitamin E, ginkgo, fish oils, St. John's wort, NSAIDs, Xeralto, Eliquis, and Verdaxa. So if you're on any of those meds, you will have to stop that. They may have you check with your cardiologist if he, let's say you have atrial fibrillation and you take Xeralto for that. They may have you check with your cardiologist and just make sure that you're, it's safe that you're going to be able to go off of that medicine. At pre-testing, they will give you a code that you can give to your loved ones, and that code will allow them to retrieve information from the nursing staff. We like to ask that every single patient have one assigned person that calls and finds out about you. 90% of our patients are actually able to talk on the phone and give their own updates, but we understand that sometimes um, patients' families want to call and find out as well. And sometimes we have patients that are sleepy after surgery, so we do allow family members to call in to the unit and find out medical information. But the reason we give them a code is because if your neighbor down the street hears that you had surgery, and maybe you don't want your medical information out there to a neighbor, we, you are protected at a hospital where we will not give information out on you. They may find out that you're in the hospital, but we're not gonna go into detail and tell them anything without your personal per permission. So we like to re restrict that information to your family members, if at all possible. Um, and especially if you live here and you have family members up north, then 
they can't be here with you for your surgery, they may want to call. Like I said, try to designate one person that calls and checks on you. Um, we have now opened a pre-testing area down in Venice. We have a lot of Venice surgeons that come to our hospital, and so they have Venice people in their population, and we wanted to make it easy for them to get their pre-testing done, so there is a Venice office that's opened. What to bring to the hospital? We want you to leave your valuables at home. You don't need all your credit cards. You don't need cash. You don't need any of that kind of stuff with you in the hospital. We worry that things can get lost in the hospital, especially when you're going from outpatient to the OR and then up to the floor. So we want you to make sure that you leave important valuables at home. Do bring in some comfortable clothing. Remember that your extremity, whether it be your knee or your hip, is gonna be swollen after your surgery. So don't bring in skinny jeans for us to try to put on after you're going, after your surgery to go home. Your leg's gonna be swollen. You may have a bulky ACE wrap over it. So we want you to wear comfortable clothing. Um, your shoes may be a little snug. Um, and this is, we have little non-stick socks that we will give you up on the floor. And most of our patients do all of their walking with their non-skid socks on. But some people like their tennis shoes on. So if your foot isn't too swollen and you can put your tennis shoes on to walk in the hall, then you can bring those in. You just can't bring slippers or anything with a open back on it to the hospital. If possible, leave your canes and walkers at home. So your canes, need, if you do need a cane in order to get into the hospital, if your family member or friend can take it home, that's great. If not, they will lock it up in a locker, but make sure that you have a name tag put on it because a lot of canes look exactly alike. Again, the less things that you bring in with you, the better because then they're less likely to get misplaced. Uh, if your doctors told you that you're going to be leaving from the recovery room or very soon after your surgery, you may need to get a walker ahead of time. And the walkers that we use at the hospital are just the two-wheel walkers so that we don't use the fancy schmancy Cadillac ones with the handbrakes and the seats because those are really kind of dangerous when four wheels are all moving at the same time after you've had orthopedic surgery. So they want the ones that just, they're called real, rear wheel walkers that just have the, the um, I'm sorry, front wheel walkers that have just the wheels in the front and the studs in the back so that you're able to move along quite nicely with those. We have walkers at the hospital that we allow you to use um, when you're here for your stay. And if you're going to be, the only people that would need to purchase one ahead of time would be somebody that's, like I said, if your doctor says, I'm going to try to send you home that day, that wouldn't give us enough time to order your equipment. But we will order your equipment, anything that you need for the home. A lot of times our case managers will go in, especially if you have a knee or a hip, they'll ask you what your living conditions are like and how high is your toilet. Because... A lot of homes still have the very low toilets. And if you're a tall person, that's gonna be very hard for you to get on and off of when you have a knee done, because you're not gonna be able to bend like you used to. So we may order you a commode chair. And that commode chair just goes over the top of the toilet and it has two arm rails on it. So that that will help you. It's a little bit higher. It'll allow you to stand up and move, get up and off the toilet. Same thing with your hip. You don't want to be flexing at a 90 degree an angle after hip surgery. So we may have to order that kind of equipment for you. Um, glasses, hearing aids, and dentures. Make sure that if you have to take any of those things off prior to going back for, the, for your surgery, that they're in labeled containers so we know where they are. Um, and you are welcome to bring in hard candy, chapstick. The most frequent complaint that people will have after their surgery is that their throat is sore. 
your throat may be dried out. There's sometimes is a tube that goes down your throat when you're back in the operating room to help you breathe. So sometimes your throat can be a little sore. And the Sepacol lozenges that we can give you here at the hospital, we, number one, need a doctor's order for. Number two, they taste awful. So you're much better off bringing in whatever you like at home, cherry, halls, or whatever, to kind of bring that candy in if you need that after surgery. Chapstick, your mouth may get very dry. Again, you can bring chapstick, lipstick, anything like that in from home. If you have sleep apnea, we want you to bring your CPAP machine in, mainly because you're used to your own machine. You know how to use it. It's a lot easier. We can assist you in setting it up, but we don't have enough CPAP machines in hospitals anymore for every single patient. So we like you to bring your own and it does make you feel better knowing that you have because your mask for your CPAP machine is designed specifically for you. Um, and spine patients, if the doctor ordered you a brace before your surgery, we want you to bring that in. A lot of patients after spine surgery need their brace on in order to be able to ambulate. These are examples of shoes that really we don't want you to wear in the hospital. This one has, while it's a sneaker and it looks comfortable, it has no back. So it's like a slide in, almost like a slipper. And these, even though the back is closed, um, Crocs can be dangerous just because they're plastic and they don't have like a really good non-skid. So we want, before your surgery, these are just some common sense things that we want you to do to prepare your home for the surgery. So we want you to have clean linens on your bed. Prepare some meals and freeze them. If you're the person that normally does all of the cooking in your home, you're not gonna wanna stand over a stove and make spaghetti for your entire family. So prepare some things and have them frozen. Easy things that you can just warm up. Pick up any throw rugs. Throw rugs on the floor can be a trip hazard, especially when you're walking with a walker. So we like our patients to look around when they go home and see how can I safely get from my chair to the bathroom, to the kitchen, and do I have a straight, clear path? Are there things in the way? We definitely don't want electric cords or any obstructions that you're gonna be tripping over. Put some night lights in your bathroom, your kitchens, and your hallway. When you're getting up, you're a little impaired now. So now you're getting up, you have this leg that doesn't work exactly like it used to. So make sure that everything is very well lit. So if you do have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, you can do it safely. Arrange pet care if necessary. And that's only for people that have really big dogs. Um, I had a golden retriever that no matter how we tried, she was the best dog, but we couldn't get her from jumping on only me when I would come home. So she was 90 pounds. So if, had I come in after hip surgery and she jumped on me, she could knock me down. So we just have to be careful that the pets, especially they're gonna miss you so much when you're here in the hospital. So just make sure that somebody has them kind of just holding on to them when you first come into the house. The night before your surgery, they will call you. Our pre-testing department will call you. If you do not hear from them between 5 and 6 p.m., that is the number, 342-2260, and you can ask them what time you need to report. Our surgery schedule is fluent. It's constantly changing based on patients who have to cancel, patients who have to get added on. So. We just like to hold off until five o'clock the day before. They may call you at two or three if we're pretty sure what time we need you to come in, but we usually want you here two hours before your surgery. There's a lot of things that they're gonna need to get done. Do not eat or drink anything after midnight. This is probably the most important thing. I've had patients tell me, I had to put a sign on my fridge because I'm so used to getting up at two in the morning to go to the bathroom and come out and have a chug of milk so put a sign on your fridge if you have to, but nothing to eat or drink. They want that stomach completely empty. 
Do not drink any alcohol for about 24 hours prior to your surgery. Alcohol can interfere with a lot of the anesthesia meds. So we don't want you to be have any alcohol on board. If you normally consume alcoholic beverages, if you're a person that drinks two or three beers a day, two or three glasses of wine a day, please just share that information with your doctor so we can make the best post-op plans for you. Shower the night before your surgery or the morning of. Important to just clean your body really well before you come in for surgery. You're not gonna be able to shower for several days after the surgery, and you won't be showering here in the hospital. A lot of patients think I'm gonna get up the day after my surgery and go take a shower. Showering is a very big fall risk, and a lot of surgeons don't want the, all that staff from your skin getting over a new incision. So we don't shower you, but we will help do a little bedside bath with you. If you get a fever, a cold, or a rash all over your body prior to your surgery, just call the doctor and let them know. You Let's say you wake up the morning of your surgery and you go, man, I just don't feel good, and you take your temperature and it's 102, you need to call and we need to cancel that surgery. We need to figure out what is causing your temperature to be 102 prior to you coming in for surgery. And I know that's so frustrating for a lot of folks because you wait to have this surgery done, you've been anticipating it, but we just don't know what is gonna happen. And some people it's just a cold, some people it's a virus. Um, so we just don't, we wanna operate on you when you are in optimal health. So we don't wanna operate on you if you're sick with some other, for some other reason. The day of your surgery, you will come to that front desk where you'll be greeted by our volunteer staff. They, you tell them, I'm here for my surgery. If you come in before the volunteer, before the front door opens, which is at eight o'clock. So our front door stays closed at night and they don't open until eight. So let's say you have your schedule for surgery at seven, you will come through the emergency room entrance and there's instructions on how to get to registration from that area. But if you're a later surgery, you may be able to come in, meet our volunteers. They will take you to registration, which is just down the hall. They will put, um, once you're registered, they'll put the armband on you that has a barcode on it. And the barcode is used for us to scan every single time we give you a medication. So it connects you to your medical record and to your medication list. You'll be escorted up to the second floor of the hospital called the outpatient department. In the outpatient department, you will change into a hospital gown. You'll be given a plastic bag for your clothing. They're gonna start an IV. If anything happens while you're waiting to go back for surgery, your hand starts to get irritated, it's swollen, you can just let your nurse know. Um, and they can start an IV somewhere else. And your doctor will pop in to see you and he will confirm your surgery site. So he's gonna put a little yes, either on your right hip, your right knee, your left knee. He'll put a little yes, basically saying, he's gonna say to you, Martha, you're here for your right knee surgery. I'm gonna put a little yes that you and I are confirming where I'm doing your surgery. After they have you all ready and the OR will call and say, we're ready for Mrs. Smith to come over, your family will part with you then. They can come into that outpatient room with you, but then that, this is where they will go to the surgery waiting area. And there is a patient tracker that will be in the surgery waiting area that shows exactly where you are. OR7, it'll show when you go to the recovery room. It'll show when a room is assigned to you. The surgeon, if he didn't mark your site in the pre-op area, he will mark it there in pre-op holding. It's like a big holding room with several other patients that are all waiting to go back as well. And this is where you're gonna meet your anesthesiologist again. And he's gonna have a little chat with you and find out how are you doing, how are you feeling, are you feeling a little nervous? It's very normal to have some anxiety prior to having surgery, very normal. 
So don't feel bad about saying, gosh, doc, I'm really a little nervous. Because at that point, he can give you some medicine. We're ready to go. You may just be waiting for the room to open up. And he can give you some medicine to help you relax. A lot of times our patients, when they wake up, say, the last thing I remember was that anesthesiologist saying, I can give you something to help you relax. And I woke up and I'm up here on the floor. So that's the way we'd like it to happen. Um, there is medicine to help you relax and it makes you very happy and comfortable and it's a very good medication. So if you need it, the anesthesiologist can give it to you at that time. In surgery, hospitals have uh, routines that we do and it's called a timeout and it's a safety routine. So prior to doing any surgery, you may still be in that twilight, twilight sleep where you're kind of awake, you can hear people talking, but the timeout is a safety precaution. And what they will do is you will hear a nurse say, timeout, and your surgeon will be there as well. They will verify that they have Mrs. Smith. They will verify your ID number if you're awake, you will say, yes, I'm Mrs. Smith, my date of birth is blah, blah, blah. They will verify we are going to operate on Mrs. Smith's right hip today. They will look and make sure the yes is on the right hip. They will look at the x-rays that are hanging. Yes, it's the right hip. The whole process is quite impressive and it takes a while before they are you are cleared to be able to let them operate on you. For hips and knees, we give the range of 45 minutes to 90 minutes in the operating room. So just depending on how bad that old joint was, how much time it takes them to get the new joint in there. So it takes around an hour and a half on the operating room table. Spines take a lot longer. There's often multi-levels that they operate on. So we, spine surgery, it just depends. It, it can be four to six hours sometimes for spine surgery. After the surgery, that surgeon is gonna go look for any family members that you might have. They, they'll ask you when you're in pre-op, is there anybody here waiting for you? And what is the name of that person? So that the, they hand that little note to the doctor so he knows who to go and look for. Sometimes family members aren't here. So there may be a phone number for him to call and just say, I operated on your mom. She's doing great. Everything looked good. The hip was really bad. I mean, that's, I, I know that this is what they say because this is what the patient's family members <laughs> tell them that they say when they come up there. You don't want a surgeon to say, your hip looked really good, but I put a new one in anyway. So everybody's hip is really bad, but we operated on you and you have a brand new hip. So in PACU and the recovery room, they're gonna be keeping really close tabs on you. So you're gonna have one nurse assigned to you and they're gonna be taking your vital signs very frequently. A lot of people wake up and it takes them a little while. Some people are very sleepy. Some people are less sleepy. Some people have pain. Some people, it's hard to wake them up. So everybody's different how they wake up from surgery. So that's why they keep you there. A lot of times family members don't understand like why do they have to be there an hour? It takes a while for you to be fully awake your vitals to be stable, your blood pressure to be within normal limits before we bring you up to the floor. And they have an anesthesiologist that's right there that works with them. So if you do have a lot of pain, they're able to treat that pain immediately for you when you first wake up. When you're brought to your room, your nurse may have five or six other patients. So that's why we need you to be stable when you come up to the floor. I will tell you, most of our patients that roll up are wide awake, usually eating ice chips, saying hello. Um, I know because I'm the charge nurse and I sit at the desk and they, the recovery room nurse will bring them up and stop and the patients will all say hi. So that's our first meet and greet. Um, I will see you when you're out doing your rounds. Um, but that is the first time and most of our patients are wide awake when they come up to the floor. If you are a little sleepy, it's okay. We usually tell your family, just let you wake up kind of on your own. Sometimes patients are sleepy because they woke up in a lot of pain 
and the recovery room nurse had to give them some IV pain medication to just kind of help you relax and feel a little bit better. So sometimes you're a little sleepy more from the medication. But your family can see you once you get up to the floor. So as soon as you're assigned to that room and you're in that room, your family members can come and see you. Our visiting hours are from 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. Once you're in your room, the nurse will see how you're feeling. Like I said, most of our patients roll up, they're already eating ice chips. So we'll ask you when the nurse goes in the room and she's doing your assessment, she'll say, how do you feel? Are you nauseated? Some patients have some problems with nausea. We've gotten a lot better with the pre-op meds that we give patients, so we don't have as much nausea with post-op patients like we used to. But if you feel like, you know, I'm really not hungry, like I don't even feel like I wanna eat anything, don't eat anything. Just tell the nurse, I'd like to just stick with ice chips and maybe some liquids for right now. Because that may be your body saying, don't put any food in my stomach right now. Now your family members think it's terrible that you haven't eaten since 10 o'clock the night before and they're gonna be like, you need to eat. But some of our meals that come up, even our lunch meals are pretty heavy meals. So if there's something, if you say to the nurse, you know, I'm really not that hungry, but you know what I'm really craving is some chicken noodle soup. We will special order that from the dietary department and make sure that that might be your first post-op meal. I always tell my patients, you know, if you like a grilled cheese sandwich or things, try to stick to things that are going to be a little bit more palatable. And if it comes and you just are like, hmm, I don't think so, don't eat it. No, you're not going to, nobody will die of malnutrition from not eating that first post-op meal. We can stick to just liquids. Sometimes patients, their throat is really sore. And that may be more sore than even, you don't even feel your hip, but your throat's really sore. So we have popsicles, we have ices, and we tell you just start eating those ice chips. The more you swallow, the better your throat's gonna feel. It's dried out. We give you medicine to kind of dry all those little mucous membranes. Your throat's gonna be dry. So just start drinking and popsicles, ices, all of the Italian ice. Um, your belongings are kept in a locker downstairs if there's nobody here with you, and sometimes even if there is somebody here with you. Um, so we just remind us when you come up to the room, my cell phone's locked up in the locker downstairs, and we will get a volunteer to run down there and pick those up and bring them up to you once you're in your room. So pain management, next to safety, the most important thing that we worry about with our patients is pain management. So we have a little scale that we use, and it's 1 through 10. And basically, you're going, we're very happy if our patients are right 3 to 4. You're, you're probably not going to have any pain if you had a block when you first come up to the floor. And you may feel great until that block wears off. But most of our patients are going to have some pain. So don't have that unrealistic expectation that I just had surgery and I'm not going to ever have any pain. You're going to have some pain. Most of our patients have been living with pain. That's what made you go see the doctor to have your knee replaced or your hip replaced. And a lot of times our patients will tell us, the pain I'm having in my hip right now is nothing like the pain I was having before my surgery. It's a different kind of pain. Incisional pain tends to be a little burning. It feels like it's on fire, um, as opposed to that dull, achy, toothachy kind of pain that you had prior to your surgery. That just doesn't go away. So a lot of our patients feel better than they did prior to their surgery, but they are still gonna have some pain. But you're in luck because out of every floor in the hospital, the orthopedic floor knows how to manage your pain. So pain management, it's important to not let that pain, don't be a hero, don't let that pain get out of control. And sometimes my patients will tell me, oh, my neighbor told me to get ahead of the pain and I'm not having any pain now, but I wanna take a narcotic just to not have pain. So the way narcotics work is narcotics work on pain receptors in your brain. 
So if I give you a narcotic when you're having no pain, it's going to do nothing for you. It really doesn't have an action. It's not going to prevent you from ever having pain. It's just probably going to make you sleepy, and narcotics will make you constipated, the two bad things that can happen from narcotics. So what we mean is that when you come up to the floor, you may not feel a whole lot of anything. But when you start to get that burning, I had a patient tell me, it feels like somebody is like, like I have a really bad sunburn right over my right hip. When you start to feel that, that means that those pain receptors are starting to wake up. And we're gonna ask you to rate that pain on a scale of one to 10. So if it's hurting really bad, you're gonna rate that pain higher, which will allow you to get a higher dose of medicine. If the pain just is starting to wake up and you're like, it's only like a three or a four, but it, it's burning right there, we will give you a lighter dose of the medication and that's how you will get your pain medicine. It's important in the morning, especially that first day after surgery, to take pain medication before you do physical therapy. So the physical therapist will come and talk to all of the nurses and say, I have your patient, Mrs. Smith, in room 405. I wanna go work with her. When was her last dose of pain medicine? And if it's been three hours and 55 minutes and you're due for pain medicine in five minutes, the nurse is gonna tell that physical therapist, hold off, let me medicate her. And that's kind of how they do their schedule is based on who's had pain meds, who hasn't had pain meds. There's some patients, the physical therapist wants to work with you, but maybe you're nauseated, maybe you're extremely sleepy, maybe you had a really bad night and you just fell asleep at eight o'clock in the morning and you wanna sleep for a little bit. So they kind of work their schedule based on who's ready to get up and get moving. Pain medications are prescribed as PRN, meaning we don't automatically go in there every four hours and hand them to you, but we will offer them to you. And there will be a whiteboard in your room, and at the bottom corner of that whiteboard, we will write when we gave you your pain medication. A lot of times that helps patients know, oh, I have to wait another hour, or oh, I think it's time I could have another pain pill. But we like to stay up on your pain medications about every four hours. You're going to need that initially. Some patients don't. We've had patients that can do it with just plain Tylenol after surgery. But a lot of patients will need that help of that narcotic in that short-term period right after they have their surgery. So just communicate with the nurse. The nurse is the best person to be on your side for this because they will communicate then to the physician. And we have those PAs on the floor, both Jen and Chase can adjust your medication based on how you're doing. Let's say your physician ordered you Percocet, but Percocet is now making you sick to your stomach. We may need to change that medication to something that's more tolerable for you. And we may ask you, what have you taken before in the past that works really well for you? And you may say, I take hydrocortone and I don't have any problems. So we may switch your pain medication to that. Sometimes there's additional pain medicine that we can give you either through your IV or by mouth. Sometimes our hip patients have a lot of problems with cramping. They'll have a lot of cramping in their upper thigh muscle. And that's because of the moving around that the surgeon has to do when he moves those muscles out of the way. So sometimes you can get cramping in that and we may have something to help with that, a muscle relaxant that we can give you that works in addition to the narcotic that we've given you. If you're getting a narcotic that's making you too sleepy or too nauseated, we need to change that medication because we want you to be able to get up and get moving and move around and do all those things so that we can send you home safely. Your prescribed pain meds are gonna vary depending on your history and the severity of the pain you're having. Just know that with any pain narcotic medication, there are some side effects. Constipation is the most common side effects. Nausea and vomiting, respiratory depression and sleepiness, and a lot of patients will complain of itching. If you, if you all of a sudden start itching, we every patient that's on pain medication should have Penadryl ordered or we can get it ordered to help with the itching part of it. But those are some side effects. 
I want to talk a little bit about the constipation because we've had a lot of patients that have come in for joint surgery and they will tell us, I haven't had a bowel movement I, for seven days prior to my surgery. Well, now we just did surgery and that anesthesia slows your gut down and then we're giving you narcotics on top of it. We really want you to try to, some people say I only have a bowel movement once a week and I didn't have one this week. We want you to try to make sure that you have a bowel movement before your surgery, the day or two before. And there's lots of ways that you can do that gently and without taking medicine. There's over-the-counter stool softeners, there's Miralax, there's, you don't have to clean yourself out like you would for GI, like a endoscopy or colonoscopy, but there are medications that you can take to kind of make sure that you have a BM so that you don't come in and you're already behind the eight ball where you're saying, I haven't had a bowel movement for seven days and now you may be in the hospital for three days, so now it's been 10 days. And we cannot safely send you to a rehab center without you having a bowel movement. So if you have a bowel movement before you come into the hospital, then if you don't have one for a couple days, there's lots of stuff that we can give you. Some patients say, I take Miralax at home. Can you ask the PA to put that on my medication record? And we will put that on there. Some patients say, warm prune juice does it for me. Some people will say, just my first morning cup of coffee and I'll be good. You know what your body's used to. Just know that the, between the anesthesia and the pain medication, it will slow your gut down. So it's normal to not have a bowel movement right away. So we want you to make sure that you kind of have that stomach cleaned out. So we want to prevent any complications from happening. We don't want you to get a blood clot in your leg from not moving around. We don't want you to get pneumonia and we don't want you to get any kind of a surgical site infection. To prevent you from getting a blood clot, we have these magic little things that will go on your lower legs. They're called SCDs. Sequential compression device is what SCD stands for. And it will blow up and go down intermittently while you're in, in the hospital. Sometimes I have patients tell me, oh, it's not working on my right leg. But if you had a block on that leg, you're not going to feel it going up and down. But these will inflate and deflate. We're also going to put on the famous TED hose, the white compression hose that also compress and help the venous system from pooling too much blood down in your ankles. You will be on some type of an anticoagulant after your surgery. Most doctors will manage you with just plain aspirin as your blood thinner. It's an antiplatelet agent, prevents clotting. But some patients need something stronger based on their medical history if they have a history of AFib or a history of DVT in the past. <clears throat> some exercises they're going to have you do, and the physical therapist will go over that, and it's ankle pumps where you're pushing down on the gas pedal with both legs 10 times every hour, ankle circles where you just circle them around. They're going to ask you to squeeze your butt. Those are called gluteal squeezes. And quad sets are where you're just going to lift that leg up off the bed 10 times. And the most important is early ambulation. If you have your surgery in the morning, you will get up with the physical therapist in the afternoon and walk. Now, some people aren't able to walk, mainly if their block is too strong. But at least the physical therapist will stand you up, assess how strong your leg is. Are you going to be safe to be able to get to a bedside commode? Are you going to be able to walk to the bathroom? And they will do an, a full physical assessment on you after your surgery so that we know what we are safely able to do until that block wears off. Preventing pneumonia. We have this little wonderful tool that we use to prevent pneumonia. And it's called an incentive spirometer. It's just a little fancy piece of equipment to let you visualize whether or not you're taking a deep breath. The nurse is going to set an individual goal for you, usually based on your size and how much you weigh. So people that are tiny may have a, a lower tidal volume that we're looking for. Most patients should be able to pull about 1,200. Some patients can pull a lot more. Big men can pull a lot more. 
So what you're going to do with this is you don't blow into it, you suck from it. Like you're taking a drink of a big milkshake. So you put it in your mouth and it's just a way, I could go in your room and tell you take 10 deep breaths, but it's a nice way for patients to visualize. Am I really taking a deep breath? Is it, do I go all the way to the goal that the nurse set for me? 10 times every hour. We want those big deep breaths. When they put you to sleep, anesthesia kind of makes your lungs a little lazy and sometimes the bottom of your lungs, it can, you can get what's called atelectasis where the bottoms don't completely inflate. If you've just been laying in the bed, oh, not taking deep breaths, getting pain medication, we want you to sit up, move around, take those 10 big deep breaths and that will help prevent you from getting any type of pneumonia. Infection, make sure you're doing good hot hand hygiene. We give you a little bottle of hand sanitizer that you'll keep at the bedside. Um, the doctors will give um, prophylactic antibiotics before you have to get any dental work um, after you've had a joint replacement. They like you to hold off if possible, but you know, Sometimes we can't control when we break a tooth or have an issue and need to go to the dentist. Please remember that you have a joint that we don't want to get infected. And so if you have a teeth cleaning scheduled for two weeks after your joint replacement, we need you to cancel that. That is not important. We don't want any bacteria from your mouth to get into your bloodstream and go after that brand new joint. So. If you do have to go because you broke a tooth, or let's say you have a dentist emergency and he says, I have to do a root canal, then they may need to put you on a prophylactic antibiotic prior to you getting any dental work done. Be aware of any signs and symptoms of infection, redness and swelling at the incision. Initially, when, you've, when we do your first dressing change, you're gonna notice that skin's gonna look a little angry. You know, you have staples in there, um, and you're just going to notice, oh, that doesn't look like my normal knee. But after, as time goes on, we don't like to see it go from no redness to all of a sudden there's redness. Any type of change in the incision site, color, odor, drainage, any kind of increased pain. So let's say you're here at the hospital, you're doing great, we've got your pain under control, you go home, two to three weeks after your surgery, all of a sudden, boom, your hip hurts like it did prior to your surgery. There's a lot of things that can cause that. Sometimes the hardware can shift, sometimes you can have um, a little hematoma around that area, and sometimes you can be, have an infection. Doesn't happen very often, but just know, any your, you know your body better than anybody, so if all of a sudden you have pain that you never had before, just please let your surgeon know and any fever above 101. Just make sure that you get that joint checked out so that we know that that fever isn't coming from there. Physical therapy is going to test your strength. And this is where you're gonna to have to use some really good arm strength. You're gonna be pushing yourself up off the bed and having to hang on to a walker to walk with getting yourself up off the commode. So your arm strength needs to be there. Therapy will start usually the day of your surgery, unless you're a late surgery. So if you don't come up to the floor till five or six o'clock at night, then you won't have physical therapy till the next day. The ankle pumps, the ankle circles, the gluteal squeezes, they're gonna have you doing those constantly when you're in the chair. And they will come and see you, physical therapy, after breakfast, and after lunch. So they may get you up, you'll have your breakfast, we medicate you for pain, they will get you up, take you for a walk. We'd like you to sit in the chair. We as humans are used to being vertical, not horizontal. So we'd like you to sit in the chair, you breathe easier, you breathe better, and it helps kind of keep you awake. But some patients will say, oh, I had a terrible night, I didn't sleep very well, and I'm so exhausted, can I go back to the bed? So if you're unable to make it until lunchtime, we will assist you back to the bed so you can take your nap, but then they are gonna get you up again in the afternoon and have, take you for a walk. Um, 
So that's when the physical therapists come twice a day. One out of three people over the age of 65 will fall every year. We don't want anybody to fall in our hospital. If you're on an anticoagulant, a blood thinner, even aspirin, we can have bleeding after a fall. We don't want you to break a bone. Sometimes patients will fall and can break something, not even the affected joint that they just had replaced. Surgery will weaken you, and a lot of people forget that, that you may be a little weak, you may not have the balance that you, you were used to having. Sometimes patients will try to stand on that extremity and have pain and then fall. So we want to always be with you. And you will notice that we use a lot of safety measures when we are with you walking in the hall. The physical therapist will put a gate belt around you so that if you say, oh, I just feel like my leg's going to give out, they can hang on to that gate belt and safely lower you onto the floor or we can scoot a chair underneath you. But we don't want you to fall. So our motto is call, don't fall. We don't care how many times you put that call bell on. We would rather have you call us a hundred times than to have you fall one time. We want to know. We want to do things for you. I walked by a patient room one day and this gentleman was hanging out of the bed trying to reach a piece of paper that was on the floor. I don't know how he was even still on the bed, but he didn't want to bother anybody. But he almost fell out of that bed. And he was perfectly awake, alert, oriented. He just didn't want to bother anybody. But we want to be bothered. You're not 100%. So we want to come and help you. That is our goal. That's why you're in the hospital. If the doctor thought you didn't need any help, he would send you home right after surgery by yourself. But we are in the hospital so that we can help you. So we want you to call. And when you push your call light on, that rings directly. All of the nurses in the hospital carry an iPhone. That is the hospital iPhone. And when you put your call bell on, it will ring to my aide, but it will ring to me. So if the aide answers it and you say, I need pain medication, she will click it so that it'll come directly to me and I'll say hello and you'll say, I could really use some pain medication. If I'm already in the pain in, in the medication room drawing pain medication for another patient, I can get your pain medicine at the same time. So it saves us steps. It allows me to talk directly to you. A lot of times patients will send their family members up to the desk and that's really not a good practice because the people at the desk sometimes are physicians, they're other ancillary departments, they're not even your nurse. When you put that call bell on, it goes right to your nurse's phone. So we really encourage you to use the call bell. It's a little red button on your, on your um, hand held device. We want you to call us. If your aide is already pushing water down to other patients and you click on it and say, oh, I am out of ice water. She'll be like, I'm right outside your room. I'm going to bring it right into you. Anything from your room is considered that it has your germs on it. So nothing from your room, such as the ice pitchers, can be brought out to the nursing station or to our ice delivery station. A lot of times family members think, I'm going to help, I'm going to help out, I'm going to go get it for you. We send them back to the room with the, with the pitcher and we will bring you the ice sleeved that there's a special little plastic sleeve that goes in there that will put brand new ice water in there for you. So again, if you need anything like that, that is when you call and it will come right to the nursing staff and we, we know what to bring to you then. During your hospital stay, there will be a whiteboard in your room. And we've changed these whiteboards. These were our old whiteboards, but it's very similar to this. At the change of shift from 7 to 7.30 is when we change shifts. The nurses will come in and talk to you, give report at the bedside and talk with you about your care. So the night nurse may introduce you to me if I'm the day nurse and say, this is Mrs. Smith. She just had her right hip done. It allows me to meet you, but to also have you participate in your care delivery that day. 
So we'll talk about what are our goals, are you looking to go home, and I'll kind of explain and remind you this is how it's going to go. We're going to have breakfast. You're due for pain medicine, Mrs. Smith, at 9 o'clock. I will bring it into you so that you can have that before you do your physical therapy. We do a patient-centered report around you. Again, the patient in the center of that wheel. We are here for you and we want you to participate. We don't want you to say, well, I really don't know what's going on. The nurses don't tell me anything. We want to tell you. So we want you to be a part of your care plan. We will put our name on the board, the nursing assistant's name, the charge nurse's name goes on there, the housekeeper will write their name, and we're going to talk about your activity. You can be up at, you know, out of bed uh, as, as needed, whatever. Um, if you have limited mobility, let's say your toe touch weight bearing on one leg, we will put that on there so everybody that board kind of communicates with everybody that's taking care of you. We don't have this on our new boards. What we have is the time that we gave you your last pain medication. So that's where we write down what we gave you, Percocet 10 at 0900. So then you know, okay, I get medicated at nine. It's every four hours. I can have it again at one o'clock in the afternoon. That doesn't mean that you have to be hanging on the bed rails and crying at 12.30 because I may be able to give you something to help you make it until one o'clock. So just, again, good communication with the nurses to let us know how you're feeling. You may have routine blood draws when you're here in the hospital and because the surgeon wants to see them when they round and most of them round very early, they may be up at about five o'clock in the morning to do those. So don't throw the phlebotomist out of the room. Just know that the reason they're there early is so that we can have those blood tests back when the physician comes to see you. The vital signs, when you first come to the floor, we take them frequently, but then we get into a floor routine the first day, maybe every four hours, and then after that, twice a shift. We'll check, check your um, vital signs. Physical therapy will happen twice a day. The dressing changes, will happen certainly if your dressing gets soaked with blood or gets any kind of a contaminant on it, we're gonna change it. But sometimes that initial post-op dressing stays on until the day that you are discharged. Medication administration can happen many times during the day, but we pass meds basically twice a day. Once in the morning at 10 o'clock, that's for all your morning dose medications, and then again in the evening, we pass meds again. But your PRN meds happen throughout the day. A lot of our orthopedic surgeons give you Tylenol around the clock. They've done studies where patients who received regular dosing every six hours of Tylenol helped reduce the amount of narcotics that those patients needed. So. A lot of our orthopedic surgeons will follow that and give you Tylenol every, so there, we will be going in there giving you different meds at different times, but your morning medicines usually don't, you don't get those in between nine and 11. We have a two hour window that we give our nurses because some patients take a lot of meds and it just takes us a little while to pass medications on everybody. Um, if you take a medicine, again, if you take a medicine for your stomach, sometimes patients take a specific medicine that helps with heartburn and they like to take it before breakfast, put on there specifically a time of, I normally get up in the morning and the first thing I do is take that anti-heartburn medicine at 7 a.m. Just put that on your med list so that we can have that timed for the right time. <clears throat> nurse leader rounds are done by either me, the clinical manager, or my director. So the charge nurse, uh, there's two full-time charge nurses, me and my counterpart, Anita, and we will round on our patients. So we just kind of pop our heads in, or I'll see you walking by and I'll chat with you a little bit, but that's your time to just let us know how are we doing. Is everything going okay? And some of the things we can work on that maybe your nurse is too busy and can't work on, maybe you say like, 
oh my gosh, I felt like I got woken up every hour on the hour. Is there any way we can make that better for tonight? So those are the things that in nurse leader rounds that we hear from you that we can make changes for. Maybe you say, I'm just struggling with the, with the menu. I can't get, seem to get the right thing sent to me. I can talk to the director of the nutrition uh, dietary and let them know, hey, we really need to zoom in and figure out, can somebody come and talk to her? Sometimes patients have very specific dietary needs, such as gluten-free, and we need to actually send a dietitian in there. So those are the kinds of things that you need to just kind of let us know. Most of the time we hear, everybody's taking great care of me, I feel pretty good, but a lot of times the patients will have questions about their discharge. You'll go in in the morning and you'll say, how was your night, everything was fine, but I wanna know when am I going home and when is my equipment coming? And so then I may need to go talk to the case manager and send her in there to firm up all of those. Anything I don't have answers for, I will make sure that I get you the answers that you need. So leadership rounds are done every day on our units. <clears throat> and Somebody will be checking in on you about every hour. Either your nurse or the aides will come in and just check to make sure. Do you have a full water pitcher? Is everything okay? Um, we do use bed alarms on our, m most of our patients. Anytime you're going to be a risk for fall just because you had orthopedic surgery. And when you're a risk for falling, we put a bed alarm on. And that just means that Let's say you're that person that's trying to reach the piece of paper on the floor. It's going to alarm and it's going to let us know that person's trying to get out of bed. And it's not um, a mean thing that we do. It's a way to try to keep you safe. So we've had patients before way overestimate their, their abilities and think that, well, the bathroom's right there. I can certainly just get up and go in there by myself. We, again, Call, don't fall. We don't want you to fall. There's really no reason for you to be ambulating without hospital staff with you. We will always need to be with you in the hall. <clears throat> Unless you're there for, most of our orthopedic patients have got to have hospital staff with them. If you're there for a medical reason, you may see somebody walking around by themselves, but they may not have had orthopedic surgery. The discharge process is a process. Um, the PA may come and see you, let's say Dr. Stewart did your surgery and one of his PAs will be in in the morning to see you. So he will come and take a peek at you. Jake is one of his PAs, Russ is another one of his PAs. And they'll say, oh, Mrs. Smith, you look great. You're gonna be able to go home today. And that's seven o'clock in the morning. But maybe you just had surgery the night before and he doesn't know that you haven't even been up with therapy yet. So. He, we're going to have our PA, who also works with those two PAs, go and take a look at you. If that is your goal, I want to go home. Usually the nurse and you will discuss a discharge time. We like you to be able to get at least one physical therapy session in. If it's your first day after surgery and it's your very first time getting up, we're, we may encourage you to stay for that second therapy session. So at least two therapy sessions before you go home. If it's post-op day three and you've been killing it with therapy, just doing really well, and you want to go home after your morning session, we'll negotiate a time. Tell your, tell your wife to be here or your husband to be here at 11 o'clock. We'll have everything ready to go. We will type up a full packet of discharge instructions for you based on what your surgeon, when to follow up, if there's home health arranged, what that company's name is with a phone number so that if they don't come, you have somebody that you can call. Um, and sometimes if you have stairs at home, the therapist may say, I need to take them and work on the stairs. So there may be additional treatments. Or let's say your lab work in the morning wasn't perfect and they want to recheck it. There may be reasons why we may need to keep you till later in the afternoon. You will get typed discharge instructions. Make sure you take that packet with you when you leave. Your discharge checklist, make sure you have your papers, prescriptions for new medicines. Most of our, the prescriptions now are electronically sent directly to the pharmacy. We don't hand out paper scripts as much as we used to. And sometimes the surgeon actually gives the prescriptions ahead of time. So the patient will say, I already have my pain medicine at home. I already picked it up. Um, the physician, um, 
we do offer Walgreens rapid pickup here. So if the doctor didn't give you your medicine ahead of time and you wanna take your medicine with you, we can see if our Walgreens rep is here and we can have her deliver the medicine to you at the bedside. Personal items, make sure anything you brought in, your dentures, your eyeglasses, cell phone chargers. Cell phone chargers get left every single day. It's the last thing people remember to take. So usually the volunteers are wonderful here and they will say when they come up with the wheelchair, do you have your cell phone charger? Because they know how many times they get the patient down to the front door and they go, oh, I forgot my cell phone charger. So they'll ask you, do you have everything? So just make sure you have all of those things that you brought in, your phone, etc. If you had a walker that we ordered for you that came and was delivered by BayCare and has like a little blue thing on it for you, make sure you take any equipment that we ordered for you to take home, take it home with you. If you brought, if we told you to bring a medicine in on your own, sometimes patients are on very expensive medicine that we don't carry here in the hospital, but the doctor will allow you to go ahead and take it. If you brought that medicine in, make sure you retrieve it from us and take it home. It's locked up in our Pixis machine, but make sure you take that home. <clears throat> so the most frequently asked questions are, when can you eat? That's just gonna depend on how your stomach feels after surgery. But certainly, if you have surgery and you feel great and you're starving, I would be, I would want you know, a light meal after I come up to the floor. Can you use your cell phones? Absolutely, you can use your cell phone. The only thing we will caution you about is that no filming or taking video in the hallways of hospital personnel or of other patients. That's a violation of our privacy and their privacy. And I think a lot of times family members don't mean to, but they'll be like, I wanna take a picture of dad walking in the hallway, but they just filmed like half of the nursing staff. So just don't do anything in your room. They, you can, we have patients FaceTime and talk to their family members and anything like that is fine. Normal visiting hours are eight in the morning till eight at night. We do make exceptions for people who sometimes are confused that they will get administrative permission to allow a, a spouse to stay at night with them. Your throat's gonna be sore because like I said, it may be dry. You may have had a tube down there and I just told you all the things we can do to make your throat better. No showering in the hospital. The driving question, we get asked a lot, but we don't make that determination. That's your surgeon, and that's going to be based on how much mobility you have back in that joint by the time you go to see him. Most of, the pay, most of these guys want to see you in two to three weeks. Some people show up, and they're, they could be walking without a walker. They come in with the walker, but they're doing great, and they may clear them at that appointment to drive. Knees, it takes a little bit longer, but that is gonna be up to your surgeon to make that decision. And certainly no driving if you're still taking narcotics because that will impair your ability to drive. You'll be in the hospital anywhere. We have patients come up to the floor and say, my doctor says if I feel good this evening, I can go home. So anywhere from zero to three days. If you're going to be going to rehab, and you are a Medicare patient, you will need to stay there for the full three days before we send you out and send you to rehab. <clears throat> when do you start the new exercises? You can start practicing those anytime. My Health One, you will get this on your discharge paper, and this is the doctor's hospital portal, and it talks you through how you can access your medical information. The things that you can get off of My Health One is basically your lab work and x-ray reports. So you won't see like the doctor's progress notes, but any physician that has privileges at doctors is able to get in and see your medical record. Now, we can go to questions. I just wanted to show you um, the only you will have a menu in your room. This is the gluten-free menu. That's the only one that's in my book. But you can see that for a gluten-free person, there's a lot of options on here that they can use. But on a regular menu, every single day, there is a standard breakfast, lunch, and dinner that will be assigned to you. 
Let's say you just hate scrambled eggs, and this mor Monday morning is scrambled eggs, French toast, and a cup of fruit, and you're like, I'm not going to eat that. You can special order anything that you want to eat. There will be a number on the back of the on the back of your menu that you call right from your phone that's in the room. Every room has a phone. And you can say I'm Mrs. Smith in room 410 and I want to change my breakfast order for tomorrow. Um, they do make fantastic omelets here, so you may want to order an omelet. You may Say, I'm just really a coffee, and a coffee and cereal person. And cereal may not even have been on the menu, but it's you want special K cereal and a half a banana, you can order that. So just because it's not on the menu doesn't mean that you can't order it. But at least it gives you an idea so that you're not playing that guessing game of what's for dinner tonight. Um, like on some of the menus, like pot roast, potatoes, carrots, and vanilla pudding. Maybe you don't like that heavy of a meal and you would rather have a chicken Caesar salad. On the regular menu that we have up on the floor, it opens up like a regular restaurant menu. It'll give you all the different options of things you can order. We want you to eat stuff that you feel comfortable eating. The food is actually very good here, um, considering how many people they're serving it for. but. Like I said, you know, if there's something, if they're bringing you coffee every morning for breakfast and you'd rather have tea, that's so easy to change by just picking up that phone and calling. And if you forget how to do that, the nursing staff can help you do that so that you're eating properly and getting the right food. Our nutrition room has things like ginger ale, diet ginger ale, Pepsi. We're a Pepsi hospital. So if you're a Diet Coke drinker, you may want to bring some Diet Coke in, but we have Pepsi and Diet Pepsi and juices, prune juice, crackers, those kinds of things. And then we can special order meals for you during the day. Are there any questions from anybody? They like you to wear these for your post-op recovery. It reduces the amount of swelling that will happen, especially in your ankles. Um, they are hard to put on and off, but if you have a home health nurse, they can help you. We will put you, these on you before you leave the hospital. Um, but if patients need to take them off at night when they sleep, um, they can take them off and then the home health nurse can put them on for you in the morning. But they do, most surgeons want you to use those after surgery. And sometimes this is the thigh high one that's here. Sometimes they will just prescribe the knee high. It just depends on who the surgeon is and what your medical history is. Um, not we don't use catheters anymore um, for patients that have surgery. Um, we, they used to use them every time you had to have your hip done or your knee done. If they thought you were going to have prolonged immobility, they would put a catheter in. We don't do that as a general practice anymore, mainly because we don't want to have you get any type of a urinary tract infection. So they will hold off on doing a catheter. What will happen though sometimes with the block is when a block, a spinal block goes in, it numbs you from the waist down on specifically on that side, but your bladder can be a little numb. So sometimes patients, when they come up to the floor, just don't feel the urge to pee and sometimes can't pee, but they'll tell us, oh, I just feel like my stomach's so full. We have this thing called a bladder scanner. We can scan your bladder just using a little ultrasound machine and we can see how much urinary stuff is in there. Um, sometimes for men, they can stand up with our assistance and that will help them go. Once that block is worn off, that's not going to be an issue anymore for most people. Sometimes for people, we have to do a straight cath just until your area wakes up. But for most patients, they're able to get up and just go to the bathroom on their own. You know, we um, our visitation has gone all over the place since COVID. So during COVID, we weren't allowing anybody under the age of 18. 
The thing with visitors is children, usually under the age of five, don't understand hospital rules, don't understand, they, they are just children. They don't know how to be quiet and sometimes they're rambunctious and they want to run and they want to jump and they want to play. We understand that. Um, so for those type of ages, would, you, would I bring my young child into the hospital? Probably not. I wouldn't recommend my grandchildren. I've worked here for 27 years and I, my grandchildren have never come to visit me, mainly because it's a hospital and there are some sick people in hospitals. Um, but, and you, when you think about a patient recovering after a surgical procedure, they need rest and relaxation, not a two-year-old that's hanging from the blinds and screaming and yelling. And if they do get a little rambunctious, we have had incidents where they're running up and down the halls and trying to run, we'll ask the parent then to just please take the child. Um, so uh, for the most part, we'll say school-age children can come and have a visit with their grandma or grandpa, but sometimes the patients will say, I don't really want anybody other than my wife in here with me, you know? So for those people, we can do, that's why the volunteer desk calls us in the morning and says, is there anybody with limited visitation? So they know at the front desk who we're limiting visitation with. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Great information. <clears throat>